Hello, I'm Miss Ginsburg with No Adam, and today we're going to be reading Forests. This is a lab manual in Unit 8. Section 1. How Plants Make Food. Studying How Trees Communicate. Scientist Suzanne Simard has been studying forests in Canada for 30 years. A forest is an area of land covered with trees. In 1997, Suzanne had a question. Do trees in a forest communicate with one another and share resources? Her hypothesis was that trees in a forest are connected together in some kind of network. Suzanne designed an experiment to test her hypothesis. She focused on an area of the forest that had two kinds of trees, birch trees and fir trees, testing trees and carbon. She put plastic bags over individual trees. She then injected carbon-14 into one bag covering a birch tree to see if it would transfer some of the carbon to other trees nearby. Carbon-14 is an isotope of carbon. This means it is one form of carbon. All isotopes of an element have the same number of protons, but they have different number of neutrons. Carbon-12 is the most common form of carbon, making up 99% of all carbon in Earth's atmosphere. Carbon-13 makes up 1%, and carbon-14 is found in trace amounts. Suzanne knew that carbon-14 molecules would bond with oxygen molecules in the environment to form carbon dioxide, she also knew that plants need carbon dioxide to survive. There are both beech and fir trees in this forest. Making food. Plants need carbon dioxide because it is an important part of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the process of turning sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water into glucose and oxygen. All plants carry out photosynthesis. This is how they make food. The glucose is a kind of sugar that holds chemical potential energy. Plants need this energy for growth and development. Different parts of the plant work together so that photosynthesis can happen. Photosynthesis happens in the chloroplasts of plant cells. Remember that plant cells are the only kind of cells with chloroplasts. Chloroplasts make chlorophyll, which is a pigment that absorbs sunlight. Not all plant cells have chloroplasts. These organelles are most common in the cells of plant leaves. Plant leaves have pores called stomata. These pores open and close to take in carbon dioxide from the environment and release oxygen. Plants are constantly taking in carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen. This is similar to how people are always breathing, but people breathe in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. The back and forth exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen between plants, animals, and the environment is called the oxygen cycle. The roots collect water and minerals from the soil. Plants use minerals as building blocks for their different structures. The stem transports water and minerals between the roots and the rest of the plant. The stem also absorbs some water, although not as much as the roots. All plants carry out photosynthesis. This is the process in which they make their own food. Photosynthesis in a forest. Plants need sunlight to carry out photosynthesis because photosynthesis is a chemical reaction. The sun provides the input of energy that turns carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. Plants use the glucose to grow and develop. They store any extra glucose in their different structures. Plants use some of the oxygen they produce. They release the rest back into the environment. When Suzanne carried out her experiment, she waited about an hour after she injected the carbon-14 into the bag covering the tree. She then used an instrument called a Geiger counter to detect whether carbon-14 had been transferred to the other trees. Experiment results. Suzanne's results showed that at the time of year, in the summer, the birch trees sent extra carbon to the fir trees. Suzanne believes this benefited the fir trees because the fir trees were in the shade more than the birch trees. Suzanne and her team did follow-up experiments. They observed that the later times of the year, the fir trees sent more carbon to the birch trees. 
She believes this is because the birch begins to lose its leaves in the fall, while the fir keeps its leaves. Without its leaves, the birch trees can't carry out photosynthesis as easily. In other words, the experiments showed that the trees shared resources with each other. Experiments also showed that healthy trees sometimes share their nutrients with sick trees. Scientists have since learned that trees and forests are connected by fungi mycelium. Trees send their extra carbon through the mycelium network to other trees. This is a Geiger counter. It detects levels of carbon-14. Sunlight in different parts of a forest. Suzanne's research also led her to conclude that there are hub trees. She calls these trees mother trees because they nurture their young. The mother trees have grown tall enough to reach the forest's canopy. The canopy is the upper layers of the forest. It is where the treetops meet and form a thick cover. Canopy trees access most of the forest's energy because of the amount of sunlight they receive. The mother trees help their young, which grow in the understory. The understory of a forest exists below the canopy. Less sunlight reaches the understory because it filters through the canopy. As a result, plants in this layer must be able to make food with a limited amount of sunlight. Suzanne's research showed that mother trees send extra carbon to the seedlings growing in the understory. This helps the seedlings survive because plants use some carbon atoms to build and repair their different structures. It also benefits the mother trees. When their offspring survive, they are more likely to reproduce and pass their genes along to future offspring. There's even less sunlight on the forest floor than in the understory. The forest floor is blanketed with decaying leaves, twigs, fallen trees, animal scat, moss, and other organic part particles. There are different layers in a forest. Each layer receives different amounts of sunlight. Understanding pH and its effect on ecosystems. When carbon dioxide mixes with water, a chemical reaction occurs. This chemical reaction forms carb carbonic acid and it makes the water more acidic. Scientists can measure how acidic a water source is by testing its pH. pH is, sort, is short for potential for hydrogen. It is a measure of the number of hydrogen ions in a solution on a scale of 0 to 14. A, a solution that measures less than 7 is acidic. A solution that measures more than 7 is basic. A solution that measures 7 is neutral. Chemists use litmus paper test strips or a liquid indicator to measure pH. Litmus paper and pH indicators will turn different colors depending on how acidic or basic the substance is. Red indicates the most acidic solutions. Blue indicates the most basic solutions. Organisms survive in environments with a certain pH range. For example, most freshwater lakes, streams, and ponds have a natural pH in the range of 6 to 8. Seawater can range from a pH of 7.5 to 8.5. However, aquatic ecosystems can sometimes become too acidic. For example, high levels of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere can increase water's acidity. This causes the pH of the water to decrease. This can harm the organisms that live there. Section two, flow of energy in an ecosystem. Storing food. Eastern gray squirrels love acorns. Acorns are the seeds of oak trees. Right before a squirrel eats an acorn, it shakes it. The shaking happens so quickly, it can be hard to see. But Michael Steele has videoed squirrels eating. When he watched the videos in slow motion, he saw squirrels shaking the acorns. Michael is a researcher who has studied squirrel behaviors. He says there is a simple explanation for why the squirrels shake acorns. They want to know if the quality of the seed is good. Depending on what they sense, they will either eat the seed right away or bury it to eat later. Why squirrels bury seeds? Squirrels bury seeds so they will have enough food to last them through the winter. Squirrels need to eat acorns and other plant materials because they are animals. 
they cannot make their own food as plants can. Instead, they have to eat other organisms for energy and nutrients. When squirrels eat acorns, they access some of the energy that the oak tree has produced through photosynthesis and stored in glucose molecules. Ecosystem relationships. Michael is particularly interested in relationships between squirrels and the trees that produce squirrels, food. But both the squirrels and the trees are part of an ecosystem. An ecosystem is a community of different species that depend on interacting with each other and their physical environment for survival. All ecosystems include living things that must eat one another for energy and nutrients. They also include oxygen and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, water, and energy from the sun. An ecosystem can be as large as a forest or as small as an oak tree. Regardless of its size, all the parts of an ecosystem work together to make a balanced system. Mutually beneficial relationships. Michael has found that squirrels and oak trees have a mutually beneficial relationship. The squirrels benefit because they need the seeds, energy, and nutrients. They also need oxygen to breathe in. The oak trees benefit because acorns don't grow well if they are right beneath the parent tree. The branches of the parent tree will block the sun. The squirrels move acorns to bury them. Gray squirrels are known as scatter hoarders. This is because they bury acorns and other seeds in many places. Researchers have found that gray squirrels have a system when they bury acorns from an oak tree. They bury less desirable acorns closest to the tree. They bury more desirable acorns farther away from the tree. If the squirrel doesn't make it back to its acorns, those acorns might grow into new trees. This benefits the oak tree because it has passed along its genes. It also benefits the squirrels because it means more food sources. This squirrel is bearing food for later. Squirrels have a competitive relationship with one another. Competition between organisms occurs whenever two or more organisms require the same limited resources. Water and food are both resources. Shelter is another resource. Squirrels will often take another squirrel supply of buried seeds if they find them. Because of this, gray squirrels will bury thousands of seeds each season. There are competitive interactions in every ecosystem. There are also mutually beneficial interactions in every ecosystem. There are also predatory interactions in every ecosystem. Predation is an interaction that occurs when the organism, a predator, eats another organism, prey. Organisms can be both predators and prey. For example, squirrels are prey to hawks and foxes. Squirrels are also predators of acorns and other plants. In a balanced ecosystem, predators and prey act as checks on one another so that no one population of organisms becomes too large. A population is all of the members of a species within a particular area. Food chains and food webs. Oak trees, squirrels, and hawks are all connected together in a food web. A food web is a visual that shows the network of food chains in an ecosystem. Food chains show specific paths that energy travels as one organism eats another. Each level of a food web or food chain is called a trophic level. Scientists study how energy flows through ecosystems to better understand how different organisms are connected together. They group organisms within an ecosystem according to how they obtain energy in a food web. Hawks are predators. They prey on squirrels and other animals. How energy flows. All energy in a food chain begins with the sun. As it shines, oak trees and other plants capture the sunlight. For this reason, plants are producers. Producers capture energy directly from the sun to make their own food. Producers always make up the first trophic level of any food web. They are the link between the energy source, the sun, and the rest of the organisms that live in an ecosystem. The next trophic level of a food web are made up of consumers. Consumers are organisms that eat other organisms for energy. All predators are consumers. 
Consumers can be herbivores, animals that eat only plants, carnivores, animals that eat other animals, or omnivores, animals that eat plants and other animals. There are three different levels of consumer. The second trophic level of a food web consists of a kind of consumer called a primary consumer. Primary consumers are the first organisms that get energy by eating producers. Many primary consumers are herbivores. Squirrels are primary consumers because they eat acorns and other plant seeds. This diagram shows a forest food web. The arrows show the path that energy flows as organisms eat one another. Plants are producers because they make their own food. The third trophic level of organisms in a food web consists of secondary consumers, which eat the primary consumers. Foxes and hawks are secondary consumers because they eat squirrels, which eat producers. In some food chains, there is a fourth trophic level, which is made up of tertiary consumers that eat secondary consumers. Mountain lions are tertiary consumers because they eat foxes, which eat squirrels, which eat acorns and other seeds. Decomposers are their own level in a food web. Decomposers are organisms that break down organic waste and feed on the nutrients. When decomposers feed on the nutrients, they are also accessing some of the energy that is stored in the organic matter. As organic matter decomposes, the nutrients within it, including nitrogen and carbon, are recycled back into the environment. Plants can access these nutrients and use them as building blocks to help them grow. Stability and change in ecosystems. Ecosystems are dynamic. They are constantly adjusting to remain balanced. If there are too many organisms competing for the same resources, there will not be enough resources and some organisms will not survive. Any event that changes conditions in an ecosystem is called a disturbance. A change to any part will impact the rest of the forest. Volcanoes, severe storms, drought, flooding, and disease are all natural disturbances that alter the forest ecosystem. Disturbances are a natural part of any ecosystem. A disturbance can be devastating. Sometimes many organisms die. Others have to move because their home or food source was destroyed. But healthy ecosystems are often able to adapt to the new situation. Sometimes the same kinds of organisms will reappear. Other times, the environment changes enough that new species move in. These changes can take place quickly or they can take many years. Forest field guide. The animal, the diet, and the behaviors. Wild turkey. Eat grasses, berries, acorns, and insects. Wild turkeys forage on the ground or climb shrubs and small trees to feed. Bobcat eats deer, rabbits, chipmunks, and wild turkeys. Bobcats stalk their prey over long distances and then leap to catch them. Coyote eat deer, rabbits, and chipmunks. Coyotes typically hunt in small packs to take down large prey. Cottontail rabbit eat grasses, leaves, nuts, and flowers. Cottontail rabbits live in burrows. Hearing is their primary defense against predators. Chipmunk eats berries, nuts, and insects. Chipmunks live in underground nests with extensive tunnel systems. They carry food in pouches in their cheeks. Barred owl eat rabbit, chipmunks, and wild turkeys. Barred owls hunt for prey during the night. White-tailed deer eat grasses, leaves, flower buds, and nuts. White-tailed deer communicate with sound, scent, and body language. Insects, butterflies and grasshoppers, eat grasses and flowers. Grasshoppers are often camouflaged to avoid predators. Butterflies migrate both north and south every year. Fungi, centipedes, and worms feed on dead or decaying animal and plant matter. Plants, ferns and grasses, flowers, acorns, blackberry bushes, produces blackberry fruit, 
and forest trees, oak, maple, and pine. Section three, tracking changes. Collecting tree core samples. Christina Restiano has traveled around the Western United States to study trees. For three years, she went to 122 different locations where Douglas fir trees grow. She used a tree corer, which looks like a large corkscrew, on more than 2,000 individual trees. By turning the tree corer again and again, she was able to pull out core samples without hurting the trees. These core samples are pencil-shaped sections of the trunk. Scientists like Christina look for patterns in the tree core samples to tell them about past disturbances. This is because trees keep a diary of disturbances in their trunks. How tree rings form. The trunk is the main stem of a tree that gives it shape and strength. It supports the leaves and branches. It also transports nutrients between the roots and the rest of the tree. The trunk grows in diameter each year. As the tree grows, a new ring is added to its trunk each year. An annual ring refers to the light and dark patterned wood that forms as a tree grows in diameter over time. The light colored layer grows in the spring. The dark colored layer forms in the late summer. The trunk, branches, and twigs of the tree are covered with bark. The bark protects the tree from insects, disease, storms, and extreme temperatures. Inside the bark is a pipeline of living tissue called the pith. The pith carries water and nutrients throughout the tree. The pith is surrounded by dense, hard inner wood called heartwood. Sapwood is the softer wood between the heartwood and the bark. Tree growth and drought. Christina and her team found th that the trees didn't grow as much during times of drought and increased temperatures. A drought is a prolonged period of unusually low rainfall, resulting in water shortages. They observed a cause and effect relationship between the amount of rainfall, the temperature, and tree growth. The rising temperatures caused the amount of water in the soil and atmosphere to decrease. This meant the trees took in less water. In response, the trees closed their stomata to try to reduce water loss through their pores. This meant the trees weren't collecting carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, so they weren't getting the energy they needed to grow. The evidence for this was in the tree rings. Thin rings mean the tree didn't grow as much as normal because of a lack of water. Thick rings mean the tree had plenty of water and so it grew a lot. Why understanding tree growth matters. Many scientists study tree rings to learn about past conditions. They look for patterns that can help them make predictions in the future. For example, one team of scientists use a variety of different data to evaluate how competition among trees affects which trees survive a drought and which one dies. These scientists found, focused on forests in California during four years of extreme drought. They found that the driest and densest forests are the most at risk of dying. These findings make sense. There is a limited amount of water in the area. Each tree in that area is competing for the same water. When there is plenty of water, this competition isn't very noticeable because there is enough water for all of the trees. During a drought, however, the competition becomes a matter of life and death for the trees. This research can help forest managers help to protect forests during times of drought. They can focus on watering trees in the driest and densest areas. Genetics and drought. Other scientists have focused on genetics to determine which species of trees are more likely to survive a drought. This is because some species of trees have adaptations that help them survive dry conditions. Remember that an adaptation is a trait that helps an organism survive in its environment. Those species that are adapted to dry conditions are more likely to survive periods of drought and reproduce, passing along their traits to offspring. Studying tree traits. William Anderegg has studied this issue. Along with other scientists, William looked for patterns in data about tree mortality. He wanted to see whether the species that survived drought had traits in common. He found that the traits most likely to affect a tree's ability to survive drought 
had to do with how it pulled in water from the soil. When there is less water in the soil, a tree's roots have to pull harder to pull in water. Some tree species, such as junipers, are better adapted to dry conditions. They can pull in more water without harming themselves. Other tree species, such as trembling aspens, are used to wet conditions. Because of this, they aren't as well adapted to dry conditions. In times of drought, they end up pulling so hard they harm themselves. Junipers are well adapted to dry conditions. Aspen trees don't have adaptations to help them survive long periods of drought. I learned a lot reading forests. I hope that you did too. I'll see you tomorrow with another one. Bye.